Praise the Lord. We did the Beatitudes, and as I was preparing them to move on forward, the Lord said, okay, now you've done the Beatitudes, but you've just gotten started on the Sermon on the Mount. And the Lord began to show me some things in this that is absolutely marvelous, connected with the anointing. Here's a statement for you. And by the way, you folks on Facebook that have joined us, glad you joined us. Open your heart to receive tonight. It's going to be good. God bless you. Amen. Amen. Here's a statement for you. Every commandment of God, every commandment of God, say that one time, every commandment of God that is to you, say that is to me, is instruction on how I am to walk in my anointing. Think about that. Obedience is better than sacrifice and to hearken than the fat of rams. So understand that every commandment that the Lord has given us is a means or a methodology by which we can walk more and more clearly and accurately in the anointing that God has placed in and on our lives. Another statement I have made before, but I want to make it again. You were anointed when he called you. But just because you are called is no sign you're ready to step into the role of ministry that he has for you. Again, are you with me on that? There is a process of growth and maturing and, well, again, just growing up into him. This statement will go along with that. Just because you're anointed is no sign your sword is sharp. In fact, just because you're anointed is no sign you've been given a sword. Well, you have the, the sword of the Spirit, but don't misunderstand what I'm saying. You may not have been released to just start cutting. Am I making sense? Okay. So what came of this was the Lord said, look at the next verses following the Beatitudes. So tonight we're going to look at verses 13 through 16. And let's see what, let's see what they say. Verse 13, you are the salt of the earth, but if the salt has lost his savor, wherein shall it be salted? It is thenceforth good for nothing but to be cast out and trodden under the foot of men. So the next three verses deal with a different topic, but the same or I should say a different imagery, but the same topic. You are the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hid. Neither do men light a candle and put it under a bushel, but on a candlestick, and it giveth light to all that are in the house. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. Well, once again, the Beatitudes were, as, as we examined them, were the attitudes that we should have, our daily, you might say, mindset, so that the anointing of God could work within us. Blessed are the poor in spirit. Blessed are the meek. Blessed are they that hunger and thirst after righteousness. Blessed are the pure in heart. Blessed are the peacemakers, so forth and so on. And as we operate in that attitude, then we also create that opening for Holy Spirit to exercise himself on our anointings. We looked at that. But now look at this. You are the salt of the earth. I've made some notes on this as I looked at it. Uh, allow me to share these with you. You are the salt. That word salt is halas in the Greek. But listen to what it means. You are the prudence. You know what prudence means? Has anybody ever been, have you ever heard that someone maybe call someone an old prude? What does that mean to you when you hear such a word as that? You're just an old prude. Well, that's an old prune. <laughs> yeah, stick in the mud. You're kind of, you know, you're just old fashioned. Duddy, duddy. Yeah. yeah, there's there, there's words to go along with that. You're you just you're out of you're out of step. You're a stick in the mud. You're an old fashioned per. You're just a thuddy duddy. Okay, but l listen to what the it means from the Greek. Okay, the you, the word halas prudence. It means intelligence, discretion, 
foresight, practical wisdom to see what is suitable or profitable. It means wisdom to see what is virtuous. Foreseeing, to have foresight, to have sagacity. Remember that word, sagacity. And to have knowledge or knowledge in science. And I found that fascinating. You know, the Bible talks about things that are called science, but it's falsely called. Well, if something can be falsely called science, there must be something real in the realm of science. We, some of us were talking about that earlier. You cannot have a counterfeit unless there's something that's real. If there were no real dollars, you could not have counterfeit money. They only have, you can only have a counterfeit when the real exists. Okay. I looked, I went and studied the word sagacity to find this. Sagacity means keenly perspective, acuteness of discernment, of quick perception, and listen to this, prophetic. You are the salt of the earth. Okay. You're all that. You are the intelligence. Don't let the world tell you that you don't know what's going on. Don't buy into that. You are the intelligence of the earth. Well, what happens if, when the next session talks about light, what happens if all the lights go out in this room? Can you read? Can, can, you, can you see to find things in your purse? No. Can you see where all the chairs are? If it's totally black in this room, you can't see anything, can you? Okay, so what do we need? We need light. You are the salt of the earth, the light of the world. If the salt and the light are taken out, the world goes blind and starts to stink really bad. Think about it. Turn the light out of the gospel, and you talk about people being dumbed down? Lord, you but goats and owls have more sense than that. Okay. So you are the intelligence. Now, I'm going to say these words, and I want you to, to say them for yourself. Write them down. Say this, I'm the salt of the earth. And the reason I want you to say it is because you, you listen to and believe yourself faster than you will anybody else. So say that again. I'm the salt of the earth. I am prudence. I am intelligence. I am discretion. What does it mean to have discretion, to be discreet? Well, yeah, but it's, it's more to it than just doing. I think discreet ties more to speech than anything else. Discreet. It does have to do with action, but being able to hold your tongue. A person who is a discreet individual knows when to talk. Sometimes it's good just to hush. Sometimes it's good not to tell everything you know. Right? Don't cast your pearls before swine. You see, revelation knowledge from God's Word are the pearls that He has given you. Don't cast your pearls before swine. They will take them, twist them, turn them all around, and then turn on you and just try to chew you up and spit you out using the old very things that you've said. I've had that happen to me. So when I say we need to be people of discretion, we need to be people who are leaning to the leading of Holy Spirit so that when He leads us to speak, we speak, and when He leads us to shut up, we shut up. Okay? All right? So say it again. Say, I am discretion. Say this, I am foresight. You know, hindsight with insight gives foresight. Hindsight's what you've learned about from the past. Insight's what you've learned about what's going on right now. And if you know how the past works and you understand how things are going on now, you can have reasonably good foresight. It's a historically documented statement. If we do not learn from our history, we are doomed to repeat it. All right? I don't, can't remember the name of the historian. I'm not sure if it was H.G. Wells, but one great historian wrote these words. The sound of history is soft 
silken slippers coming down the stairs with hobnail jack boots coming up. The person who got over into the good life forgot what took place. And when you forget your past, you're destined to hear those jack boots again. It's a, it's a worldwide phenomenon. It's been in, it's a historical phenomenon. It takes place every day in people's lives. So say it again. I am salt. I am prudence. I am intelligence. I am discretion. I am foresight. You don't just have those things. You are those things because this is what God is. You say, I am practical wisdom to see what is suitable. Was it Paul that said all things are lawful, but not all things are expedient? Sometimes it's okay to tell a joke. At another time and a place, that same joke, a good joke, a clean joke, a harmless joke, it's not acceptable. Okay? Even a child's joke may not be acceptable in certain places. Somebody's in a funeral, it's probably not a great time for a joke. Just a thought. Okay, but that's what God says the salt of the earth is, that we are the practical wisdom to know what is suitable or profitable. Yeah. There's no reason if we are the salt of the earth for us to lack any good thing in this earth because we should know what is profitable. Okay, next we are, it says, we are wisdom to see what is virtuous. We're wisdom. Think about that. We are wisdom. I can give you a verse of Scripture on that one. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 30, I believe it is. But of him are you in Christ Jesus who has made unto you wisdom and righteousness, sanctification and redemption. In Christ I am redeemed, sanctified, righteous, and wise. Say that with me. In Christ I am redeemed, sanctified, Righteous and wise. Now, if God said it, that settles it. So who are you going to believe, God or some religious-minded politician? Or better yet, some politically-minded preacher? Oh, God, that's worse. Okay. I am wisdom to see what's virtuous. I have foresight. Say that I am foresight. See, if you're all these things, if you're intelligence and discretion, and foresight and practical wisdom to see what's suitable, if you are wisdom itself to see what is virtuous, if you are foreseeing, have sagacity, you are all these things, okay? And not only that, knowledge. First Peter, now beg your pardon, Second Peter, chapter 1, let me turn there very quickly. This ought to bless you, praise God. We're almost there, right there. Second Peter chapter 1, listen to this. Whereby are given to us exceeding great and precious promises, that by these you might be partakers of the divine nature. You want, you want to walk in the divine nature of God? Well, here's how. Having escaped the corruption that is in this world through lust, and beside all that, giving diligence, watch this, to add to your faith virtue. That word virtue is not the same word that was used where it said Jesus perceived that virtue went out of him. That word virtue means power, the power of God. This word virtue means personal strength, integrity, okay, virtue. But look what it says, add to your, giving all diligence, add to your faith virtue and to virtue knowledge. Whose responsibility is to add knowledge to your life? yours. So there it is. It's within our purview. And, and it says that, that if we're the salt of the earth, we are the knowledge of the earth. We talked about just the, the word that we mentioned earlier. We are the intelligence where we are the knowledge of the earth. We are the science, the true science. Do you know that if you mix, let me start this way. Do you know what the elements of sodium are? Sodium is a solid. It is an element of itself. 
Well, tell, me, tell, me, tell me some of the characteristics of sodium, one of the most notable. No, not by itself. Sodium by itself is extremely explosive. You would not want to have a five-gallon bucket of water here and let me drop a two- or three-ounce piece of sodium in it in this room. It would blow up with a major blow. Okay? I remember in lab in high schools, we take a little teeny tiny piece of soda, sodium, and put it in to, to a metal cup of water. And I mean, it just, it'll, it's volatile. It is unstable. Tell me, what do you know about chlorine? Chlorine is a gas. It's a gas. Sodium is a solid. Chlorine is a gas in their natural states. What does chlorine do to your lungs? It mixes with the water in the lungs, forming hydrochloric acid, and will eat your insides out. Okay? Little science here. I've mentioned sodium. I've mentioned chlorine. Sodium, highly explosive, very unstable. Chlorine, a gas, very unstable, highly corrosive, and potentially deadly if mixed with just hydrogen. Just mix it with water. Mix sodium with water to blow up. Mix chlorine with water. Release the gas of, the of, of that gas or hydrochloric acid. You don't want to put that on anything. Are we on the same page? But what happens if you mix sodium and chlorine together? Makes your taters taste better. It's great for you. Yeah, it's salt. It's good on your corn. It's good on your green beans. I mean, it's good to salt the pork down with before you have your pork chops if you want to hang them. Are you with me? Something totally unstable that's explosive, something totally unstable that can be mixed with, with water can eat your lungs out, put them together, and then make them a, one of the most stable, necessary elements or compounds in the world, and that's salt. Are you aware that at one time in history, salt was worth more than gold? Think about it. Have you ever seen a marriage ceremony, a wedding ceremony, where they uh, did the salt covenant? You ever seen that? Do you know what that signifies? It means the husband is salt. Talking about two Christians. The woman is salt. But if you mix the two of them together in the same container and shake them up, which one is she and which one is he? They become. So, so there is a true science in this world. You can prove it legitimately in the laboratory. Are you with me? But there are things that are falsely so called. There was a time when theory was not considered science. It was considered an element of science because you would have a theory, but it had to be able to be proven. Are you with me? Before it was accepted as law or as, you know, as actual scientific fact. So when did evolution become a scientific fact? It never has. It is science falsely so called. Somebody had a theory, but they've never been able to prove the theory. Thank you. We're doing pretty good here tonight. Having a science class and everything else. Praise God. So say I am science. That's why you can't afford to live, my brothers and sisters, with your head stuck in the mud. You need to know about what's going on around you in the world, but at the same time, you need to keep your focus on Jesus. I've, I've talked to Brother Frank about this, and I've talked to other military people about the same thing. And if, Brother Frank, if I'm wrong, you correct me in this, okay? If you are, let, let's say that this, uh, we were in a, in a particularly combative situation, and there were, uh, and, and you were given an assignment to guard the front door. Now, inside, we're all, same people. We're, we're one team. So you don't have to be guarding me. You need to be guarding the door so that nobody comes in. But do you need to be aware of me? You need to know what I'm doing 
And you need to have the confidence that I'm doing what I'm supposed to be doing, right? And I need to know where you are, and I need to know that you're supposed that you're doing what you're supposed to be doing. And if all of us are doing what we're supposed to be doing, then we have a secured perimeter. We're aware of what's going on all around us because we can listen to the chatter. We can listen to the to the communications that are coming to us and, and, and know that. But my attention, if I have front door guard duty, my attention is to guard that door, not your window. Are you still on the same page with me? It's okay. So where should our attention be as children of God? What does Matthew 6.33 say? Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things, food, clothes, and shelters, those things that it's talking about in that passage, shall be added unto you. That's pretty good stuff, isn't it? But what if we're not seeking first the kingdom of God? What if we're not seeking first the righteousness of God? then we step outside that arena of supply that God has given to us. What's happening today? And I'm, I'm, What's happening today in the world? What's the church watching today? The church knows more about what Sean Hannity said than what Jesus said. You get, to, get around a bunch of Christians. They can tell you more about Duke football than they can about the Holy Ghost. I'm talking about preachers, folks. Get around a bunch of them, and you know what I'm talking about. Get, get, get around a bunch of them, and then give you more gossip than they can give you gospel. I hope you're hearing me. Why is that? Because they are not standing their post. Seek first the kingdom of God. I am to be circumspect, aware of what's going on all around me, but I am to keep my focus on Jesus Christ and what he has told me to do. Are we still on the same page? See, that's being the salt of the earth. That's being prudent. That's, being ha that's having foresight. That's having knowledge, real knowledge. That's having insight and wisdom. And that's also, my brothers and sisters, operating in true science. Have you ever watched a scientist pour acid into a jar? I remember these things. I don't know why I remember things like this, but I remember these things from high school chemistry. You know, things are different. But I don't even think they'd let kids do that. Nowadays, they're too scatterbrained. But when I was in high school chemistry, we would play with acids. We didn't play. We had an instructor. We had a science teacher. And we would work with acids. And I remember the day that they brought in uh, sulfuric acid. Well, that stuff will eat you. And we're talking about high concentration sulfuric acid. And we, we were told, never nip it like that. The fumes will burn your nostrils out. What do you want to do if you want to know what it smells like? You held it up in the container, you walked your hand over the top, and just drew the light aroma to you. I, was, I remember one time I thought I was going to be a police officer for a life career. And I was taking a, uh, doing a study in police science. In fact, I have an associate's degree in police science. <laughs> and we had some we had some specialists in narcotics came from the, came from Raleigh to, to deliver a full day lecture one time at Davis Academy Community College. <laughs> and they had all kinds of paraphernalia, and they had all kinds of elements of the drugs down there. You can imagine they had everything you could name. They probably had stuff we didn't even know what it was. But I'll never forget the instructor. Great instructor. He took a hypodermic needle on it, one that like they used to shoot up with on the streets, okay? But he took that hypodermic needle and he took a piece of hashish. You know what hashish is? It is the resin from heroin. It's, it's pretty raw stuff. Looked like, looked like a plug of chewing tobacco. But he took a little snip of it about the size of your little pinky fingernail there and he put it on the end of that needle and he put a match to it, that little bit teeny piece just to get a little smoke coming off of it. He said, now, gentlemen, I'm going to pass this around because you need to know. I'm going to pass this around. Take it, hold it away from you. 
do your hand like this and pass it on. Obviously, this is one of the first times they ever did that. We were in a theater type seating. But if they'd have started at the back row, it might have been better, but they started at the front row. And they passed that thing all across the front row. I'm talking about highway patrolmen, state uh, 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 deputy sheriffs from the county, police officers from all over the state, and every one of them was packing heat. And they, they passed that thing down the front row, and it started up the second row, and then they came back to the third row. By the time it got to the third row, some of them weren't doing this. It was already affecting some of them, and it went by. I, I watched this one guy went by him. He went, the president. <laughs> they were getting loopy, and and uh, uh, fortunately, he had some people down front that had, with him, part of his team. And he said, "Okay, gentlemen, this this is it. Stop." He he told somebody. He said, "Turn on the exhaust fans because they could use that for also a chemical laboratory. Turn on the exhaust fans. Let's clean this place out. Go retrieve that stuff, gentlemen." You will now remove your sidearms. <laughs> and he didn't play. He didn't play with him. He didn't play with him. He went by and and he he and his team they collected the sidearms of every law enforcement officer in that room. But that 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 see that was that was stupid. <laughs> that wasn't science. That was stupid. Nevertheless, it doesn't take much sometimes to get somebody's attention. But we we need to be aware. Okay. I'm, oh, Lord God, help me, Jesus. This is good stuff. We are the salt of the earth. Now, look at this. All of that's who you are. You got that? Okay. Now, let's look at something else. Look what he said about salt. You are the salt of the earth, but if the salt has lost his savor. I want you to notice a couple of things about that verse. First of all, you are. Well, if you are, then... You am. So say, I am. I am. I'm not going to be. I am. Come on, Facebook folks, say it with me. I am the salt of the earth. Not only are you the salt, but look at his next line. If the salt has lost his favor, S-A-V, the King James O-U-R, we would say it S-A-V-O-R, okay? It, it means potency. It means its effectiveness, what it can do. But I want to I give you a little bit of a fuller meaning on that, okay? This, this is some fascinating study. If the salt has lost its savor, the Greek word for that lost his savor, all three words, it's a phrase, is moraino. Moraino, M-O-R-A-I-N-O. Moraino. You got that? That's the way it's pronounced. Morai, Moraino. It means to become insipid. That word insipid means to be a simpleton. A simpleton. What is a simpleton? Not very smart. Not very smart. Thank you. Very ignorant. Okay. And not only that, this is the root word for a word that we've all heard. Moron. So to put it bluntly, if the salt has lost its savor, he has become a moron. Now we can kind of think, chuckle about that, but that's serious business. God thought enough of you to make you the salt of the earth and you go unsalty on him? That's moronic. That is stupidity gone to seed. To have the mind of Christ to have the food with which to feed and nurture and grow that mind in great power and manifestation. That's the Word of God. To have the, uh, to have the manifestation of Holy Ghost in your life, to be the, to the, be the effector, I think that's the word, uh, of, uh, of that work in your life, to have the mind of Christ. Think about that, and then to think that you become without flavor. You, you lose your savor. You become moronic. That is a sad place to be. Have you ever run across somebody who is backslidden on God? I mean, just really backslidden on God? What's the difference, you see? Yeah, between the difference in day and light, isn't it? Okay. What the, the difference is this, when they lost their savor, 
they became spiritually a moron. And keep your heart, Proverbs 4.23, keep your heart, your spirit, with all diligence, for out of it are the what? The issues of life. And if you have allowed yourself to become savorless, you have lost your flavor, your ability to seize it, your ability to preserve, then you have made a moronic decision. I'm not trying to be ugly to you, my brothers and sisters on Facebook and all anybody here. I just want you to understand, we're talking about some dangerous stuff. And one of the things we're seeing in the world today is too many churches today should be called the church of the moron. Because they are doing anything but what the Word of God says to do. They've lost it. They, they, they Again, I, I'll say it before, they can tell you more about a Duke football game than they can about the... Uh, the, the disciples of Jesus. They can tell you more about gossip than they can the gospel. Tell you more about politics than they can purification. God help us. Okay? You are the salt of the earth, but if the salt has lost his savor. Notice that. What savor? Why? His. His. I know some translations would use its. But I want you to understand the adverb or the adjective to describe this savor is in the masculine sense. It is a his. It makes it very personal. You're the salt. So if you lost your savor, it means that he, she, or his as the body of Christ has lost his Safe. Lost it. You didn't say it was stolen from you. It's been lost. I was thinking about this earlier today, and I realized the, the, the topic of the parables, the, the, the parable of the lost sheep. You know that in Luke chapter, I think it's 15? Well, in that same parable, there's also other parables. There's the parable of the woman who lost her coin. And she tore the whole house up to find that one coin. There's also in that the parable of the prodigal son. Each one of those is talking about a lost sheep. There's something that we need to see in that. Uh, and again, I want to distinguish between the two, but what I'm talking about now, focusing on, is that something is lost. Are you with me? In the parable of the lost sheep in Luke, I think it's 15. In fact, let's not think, let's, don't lose your place in Matthew. Let's look there just to be sure because uh, if there's any place we need to be certain of things, it's in the Scriptures. Yep. Luke 15, verse 4. What man of you, having an hundred sheep, if he lose one, doth not leave the ninety and nine in the wilderness and go after that which is lost until he find it? And when he hath found it, Are you, you got that? Now, that's what we read in Luke. But when this parable is told in another place, the scripture is, the scripture says this, he, he leaves the 90 and 9 and goes looking for the one. And this is what the writer said, and if so be that he finds it. What's that say to you? Well, Frank, would you look that one up for me right quick? If so be. It leaves a question in your mind as to whether or not. Beg pardon? Matthew 18. Thank you, dear. So we run back to Matthew here right quick. I appreciate good Bible scholars being in our presence. Let's see. Yep, there it is. What am I looking at? You say Matthew what? What verse? No, that's a different deal. That's, all, that's, just, that's, talking, about, that's talking about the eye offending thee. That's a different one. Oh, this is talking about, there it is. How think you if a man have a hundred sheep and one of them is gone astray, doth he not leave the ninety and nine and go into the mountains and seeketh that which is gone? And if so, be that he find it. 
Again, that leaves some valid question in one's mind as to whether or not the sheep can be found. Are you with me? Okay. If so be. So what about the, the, the next parable in, in uh, uh, we looked at it in, in Luke 15. The next parable was the parable of the woman with the coins. Either that woman having 10 pieces of uh, silver, if she lose one, one piece, doth not light a candle and sweep the house and seek diligently till she find it. All right. Now, when she finds it, that's a positive outlook by Dr. Luke here. But the point, what if she doesn't find it? Now, in this case, she knew it was in the house. So there's a limited location. But when you lost a sheep in the mountains, that's like, hang my whole damn ball game. You're talking about a horrendous range that you have to cover to find something. But in the house, at least you know it's in the house. But the point is, she didn't stop searching, stop sweeping, stop moving around until she found it. There's work involved, intense work. There's, very, there's a deep drive and passion for that. So what I want you to understand is, if we can lose our savor, we can get it back. But the question to you and to my brothers and sisters on Facebook tonight, if you've lost it, are you willing to pay the price to find it again? Thank God for Jesus. If you confess your sin, he's faithful and just to forgive you and cleanse you from all unrighteousness. But that doesn't mean you still don't have to repent and do your first works over again. All right? We need to come back and do some regrowing, some changing. So let's, let's, let's learn these things. But if the salt has lost its savor, back in our passage here in Matthew, if the salt has lost its savor, wherewith shall it be salted? Look at this. It is thenceforth, or from that time forward, good for what? I didn't write this, folks, but I can't apologize for it either, for it is the Word of God. It is good or nothing. But here's the only thing it's good for, to be cast out and to be trodden under the foot of men. Have you ever known, I have to guard how I'll say this. Have you ever known a Christian who seemed to be troubled all their life with just being stepped on by everybody? Hmm? Is it possible they lost their savor? Just a thought. If you are a Christian, um, specifically to the group watching on Facebook tonight. I, yeah, I think you guys are, are here. I, I, I know you well enough. I think you got a pretty uh, square hold on things and the nuts are tightened down. Bolts aren't loose. If you are someone who seems to find yourself falling underfoot, perhaps you should check and see if you got all your silver. Perhaps you should check and see if you've lost your savor. I'll be honest with you, I think it's difficult for a bleeding world to tread on somebody who's salty. You know what iodine is? What is it? Yeah. You, you know what one of the elements in iodine is, the kind that you put on your cuts if you work in those days? Sodium. Because iodine or iodide by itself is not stable. But when you mix sodium with iodide, you get what we call iodine. And that's what they put on, back in those days, cuts. It was a germ killer. It was a salt. What happens when you rub salt into a cut? What do you think happens to the world who is already cut up and bleeding when it tries to come and jump on salt? It don't jump many times. Think about what I'm saying to you. We create our own problems many times in life 
because we've lost our saltness in an arena of life. Doesn't necessarily mean you've lost it all, but you just lost it in an arena. And in that arena, some people have lost their saltness. In fact, some people I don't think ever had their saltness where prosperity is concerned. And as a result, they stay poor their whole life. If you're not salty where your healing is concerned, you're going to find sickness and disease beating the door to your path every day of your life. We need to be salty. I, I, I'm making a statement. Sometimes people, I don't think, understand what I mean by it, but what I mean by it is what I said. Yeah, I live in my home with my wife. I am not going to allow anybody to just walk through my front door, steal what I have, harm her, and do, do damage to my home. I'm going to meet them at the door with an attitude and probably a gun. You understand what I'm saying? See, I'm salt, and I will light you up if you harm her. Are you with me? I will light it up if it harms the people I love. I will light it up if it's coming after me. I'm not going to lay there and be a, a road for the devil to run over. I'm going to be the biggest briar patch he ever saw, and every thorn is going to be coated with iodine. I'm going to burn his hide off. Do you understand what I'm saying? Some people say, well, oh, that's not very godlike. Then why did God make me salty? God made me to be the salt of the earth so I could burn the devil's hide, so I could burn that that would harm me, so that I could burn that that would drag me down to its level of depravity where it's wounded and bleeding. I'm not going to be broken down to being wounded and bleeding. My Jesus was wounded and bleeding for me, so I don't have to be. And that's the way every one of us need to be. You have to have an attitude about yourself. I'm not concerned about grocery prices. My God met my need before the administration, last administration changed. He's still meeting our need, isn't he, Sharon? Praise God. I serve a God who has supply for me. I'll never lack anything. I sh the Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. And another, some translations say, I shall not suffer lack. Hallelujah. Is Jesus your shepherd? Then why suffer lack? The Bible says you shouldn't, because you're salt. You're salt. And when people get around you who try to soften you down, wear you out, and make you a moron spiritually, you need to get flared up. You need to rub some salt in that real quick. You don't need to be drawn down like that. We need to learn to stand for the truth of God's Word regardless of what anybody thinks or doesn't think. This is, this is good stuff. Hope you're getting this. So what, what has this got to do with anointing? If I don't care how much anointing you got or ain't got. If you're not salted, there's no preservation for it. And the enemy will steal you blind. John 10.10, 10, what does the enemy come to do? Steal, kill, destroy, in that order. If the enemy can get you to the point where you are not salty, he can steal from you. And I believe that includes your anointing. He can't do anything with it. But if you don't have the salt to preserve, Is it possible some people need to go back and find their anointing? All right. Well, thank you, Jesus. Let's look at verse 14. You are the light of the world. You're the what? That word in the Greek is false. It means to shine, to make manifest, especially by rays. I want you to listen to that. Write that down somewhere, rays, R-A-Y-S. Rays of, having to do with rays of light. You are the light of the world, the false, to shine, to make manifest, especially by rays, luminousness, fire, and light. So let's say this together. I shine. I make manifest. 
I have rays coming out of me. I am luminous. I bring fire and I bring light. Wow. Think about that. Now, I want to talk about rays for just a moment. In the book of Habakkuk, I remember one night seeing this in a meeting, what I'm about to talk to you about. There was a man of God ministering. I'll never forget it. And he walked over to the edge of the stage and came down the steps to, to lay hands on somebody. And as he approached them, he extended his hand. And it was like, it was like I saw laser beams coming out of his hands. And before he ever got to the guy, the power of God hit him and just rolled him back in the floor. I thought, that's interesting. <laughs> but I, I saw that. And, and then, then the Lord showed me this. And I want to read Habakkuk chapter 3, verse 4. I want to read it first of all from the KJV. Listen. And his brightness was as the light, and he had horns coming out of his hand, and there was the hiding place of his power. You got that? Let me read that to you from the Amplified Bible. His brightness is like the sunlight. He has bright rays flashing from his hand, and there in the sun-like splendor is the hiding place of his power. When I saw that, I had a whole new understanding of the first two tables of the Ten Commandments. Remember, the Bible says that God, God had cut those stones out. God had written those laws in the tables. Remember that? And Moses brought them down and broke them, threw them down because he got angry, had to go back up. The next tables of stone, Moses had to hew out of the rock, and Moses had to write the Ten Commandments, which means it took him time, hammer, chisel, and a whole lot of sweat, maybe some bloody knuckles. But God just took a table of stone, held it up like you'd hold up a book, took his number one digit, started writing number one. <laughs> Laser-like beams. That's what's in the hand of God. You got this? Why do you think the Bible says lay hands on the sick? What about those trees on either side of the garden the Bible talks about in the book of Revelation uh, coming out of the city of New Jerusalem and those trees are down from the throne of God and, th and that flow of that river and on either side there were the trees and the trees bore fruit uh, for, for its season, right? And the leaves were what? For the healing of the nation. Let me ask you a question. What does a leaf have to have? Light. It's by a river. It's got plenty of water. But if you don't put light on that tree, it won't grow that leaf. It's called photosynthesis. You are the trees of righteousness, the planting of the Lord. Hold your hand up and look at it for a second. You know what that is? That's a healing leaf. You know what it needs to grow? Light and forced water. Needs a good root system. Well, that's, Jesus said, I'm the vine, and you are the, where's the leaf growing? On the branch. It doesn't grow back on the trunk of the tree. We are where the leaves grow. We're the branches. We are the trees of righteousness, the planting of the Lord, that he might be glorified. The Bible talks about when you, you shall go out with joy and be led forth with peace. The mountains and the hills shall break for you before you. There'll be shouts of joy and all the trees of the field shall clap their hands. Hallelujah. When's the last time you walked by a tree and it clapped for you just because you walked by? Just <laughs> glory to God. Listen, you can do what you want to do with that, but that when it said trees of the field, it's a double entendre. Yeah, that means it's a two-edged sword. It has two meanings. It means the leaves of the trees out there. Nature is groaning for the manifestation of the sons of God. Do you want to know what's happening in the earth today? I'll tell you in a minute. Right now, let me talk about the leaves. The leaves of the nature, the leaves of the trees around you, nature itself is groaning for you to manifest yourself as a son of God. That means be the light of the world. Without you, 
the nature around us would lose its light. I don't know if you realize what's coming out of my mouth or not, but I'm telling you some truths that we need to understand. We are the light of the world. Are you with me? And your hands are for the healing of the nation. And we are sons and daughters of God. What's coming out of God's hands? We just read it to you from Malachi, from Habakkuk 3, 4. Lightning like rays of splendor, horns of light coming out of his hands. So what ought to be coming out of your hands? Lightning like rays of splendor. Next time you lay hands on somebody, expect some. Don't go around just wrapping your hands on anything either. Okay? We need to be discreet. We need to have discretion. We need to know when to act and when not to act. The man that Peter ministered to at the gate, beautiful, he reached down and took him by the hand, silver and gold. Have I what do you know about that man before Peter came by that day? The Bible tells us a few things about him. He came every day. Now, this was just a few days after Jesus ascended. Where was that man when Jesus went into the temple every day? Right there. Didn't Jesus reach down and take him by the hand? Just a question for some thought. Was Jesus the light of the world? When he was in the earth, he was. He said, I'm the light of the world. And he turned right around and said, now you're the light of the world. Hallelujah. You don't go around throwing hands on just everything that's laying out there with a knot on its head. And you leave it alone unless the Spirit of God directs you to it. You got that? It was a matter of just laying hands on anything. Let's just go to the hospital bar and clean the joint out. But you know as well as I do, you'd go to the hospital and there probably wouldn't be maybe a handful of get up and come out of the place. Because it's not a matter of what's in your hands. It's a matter of what's in their heart to receive what's in your hands. Oh, my. I don't know. I've quit preaching and gone to meddling tonight. His brightness is like the sunlight. He has bright rays flashing from his hands, like lightning flashing from his hand. And there in the it, it, there, there in, uh, let's see, where was it? There in the sun-like splendor is the hiding place of his power. That sun-like splendor in that that was coming out of his hands is the hiding place of his power. Not in his hands, in the light that was coming from his hands. What is the word to you? Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. There in that light is the hiding place. Oh, in the little stub up. They're here. In this light is the hiding place of his power. There's a verse of scripture some of us need to read in Acts. We need to reread it. And you shall receive power. And you shall receive power. Find Acts 1 8. Just read it to yourself. What does it say? And you shall receive power. What? After that, the Holy Ghost has come upon you, and you shall be witnesses unto me. You shall receive power after. Holy Ghost is the great revealer, but he's got to have something to reveal. So where are you going to get something to reveal? I'm going to the light because in the light is the hiding place of his power. Think about what I'm saying. In the light of the glorious gospel, this light that is shined out of darkness, this light that lights our path, that illuminates the places where our feet go, this light that is a light to our eyes that enables us to see what we need to see, 
this light that illuminates the room where you sit, this light that is a light to the whole house, wherever you are, this light that is the entrance that comes by the entrance of the word. The entrance of the word bringeth light. Go to the word, feast on the word, study the word, meditate upon the word of God, speak the word of God, keep the word in your mouth. This book of the law shall not depart out of thy mouth, but thou shalt meditate therein day and night that thou mayest observe to do. What do you have to have to observe? Light. According to all that is written therein, and then you'll make your way prosperous and you'll have good success. If you can't see it, you can't do it. I've got a message that I preach called see it, say it, seize it. Go to the Word. Get your faith built up in it till you can see it, till it's in the light. When it's in the light, say it yourself and then seize it because what you speak in the light is seizable. What you speak in the darkness, you only grope after it. What would happen if you grabbed, seized an electric eel? It could light your day up to kill you. Okay? They're found commonly in South America, and I think they're found pretty commonly in Argentina and some of the big countries down there where they have a lot of cattle and horses and, and, and open plains. Brazil is another place. And cowboys have ridden their horses into the water and happened to ride that horse through what would be like a nest of electric eels. Dead horse, dead rider. Okay? You don't want to be grasping after electric eels. You don't be grasping after lionfish. You don't be grasping after that little bitty tiny blue octopus that's in the South Pacific. You don't want to be grasping after jellyfish like a Portuguese man of war. You go out grasping for stuff, you may find some of that stuff. Your eyes need to be open. You need light and things need to be illuminated so that you can take hold of these. You see, when you see something, you take firm hold of it. Are you with me? You don't want to be going around in the dark grasping moray eels. And that's what a lot of Christians are doing. They're grasping in the sea of life for anything they can find. They need light so that you know what you're taking hold of. See it. That means light. When you see it, you say it. That means you released faith for it and then seize it because faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen now. This is good stuff. Oh, I'm glad I got into this. You are the light of the earth or the world. I like that. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hid. The word, that, that's pretty, the, the, though, by the way, when it says the light of the world, it means the word, the Greek word is cosmos. It's talking about the world system, the things of the system. I, I'm convinced that there are some people who are anointed by the Lord to be a doctor. I really believe that. And in fact, I believe I have been extremely blessed in my life to have had in more recent years, particularly one retired now, and that is my regular physician, strong believer, Christian man, mission work. And time and again, I would go into his all, go in for an exam and he would walk in the door and shake my hand and the first thing out of his mouth is, how's the ministry? How's the stress level? And before we'd get out, he'd tell me about something he was teaching on, and then he would ask me, have you got anything on that for me? And I've sent him outlines. This dear Methodist brother, I've sent him outlines on things that I've taught, and he'd teach them in the Sunday school class in the church he attended. Hallelujah. I've been blessed to have a Christian dentist. I love having a Christian dentist. I've been blessed to have Christian surgeons operate on my back, fix these eyes. Praise God. Why? At least, at least they know the one that made it. 
You know, don't misunderstand me. If we back in the old days, I, I don't want a Chevy mechanic working on the Ford or vice versa. You understand what I'm saying? Okay, they've been trained for Fords. They've not been trained for Chevy, particularly nowadays. Fat cars is a complex nowadays. If you have a certain make of car, you've got to go to a certain mechanic because the rest of them can't fix it. Right? I want a doctor when I go see him that at least knows the creator. I want him to, I want a doctor that at least, at least has read the book, operation manual. Okay. I want a doctor that knows how to put it together because if he has to go cutting on something, I want to know that he can put it back right. Well, God has been merciful to me. I've got a dermatologist that loves God, loves his word. We've had lunch with her and talked about the things of God. I love that. I love being around people like that. Are you with me? So th th that's what I'm saying here. We are the light of the world. Oh, this is good. The cosmos, the system. There are people that God has anointed to be attorneys. There are people that God has anointed to be teachers in school. Not fivefold ministry, but he, he has anointed them to be a teacher in school. There are people that God has anointed to be in a fivefold ministry and something else. God can anoint somebody the way he wants to anoint them. That's up to him. That's not my call. But understand something. When God has anointed you for something, you need to walk in that anointing because that anointing will teach you things other people in that same field will never know. Why do you think... Was it George Washington Carver that discovered so much about the peanut? Why do you think he discovered so much about peanuts? He was anointed. He was anointed. He said he would get up in the morning and just take a walk through the woods and the countryside around him and talk to God and let God talk to him. And, then, and he said, as God talked to him, nature would talk to him and reveal its secrets to him. Oh, what was he doing? Walking is in, in his anointing. Walking in his anointing. You walk in the anointing, you, be, you can be one of the greatest scientists that ever walked on the planet. Walk in your anointing. And again, I encourage you, if you don't know what it is, seek the face of God till you find out. Get with somebody who is anointed. They know they're anointed, and they know what they're anointed to do. Get with them and follow them. Walk with them. Help them. And as you walk with somebody who knows what they're doing, they will demonstrate to you, to you how you are to do certain things so you can know what to do about your own anointing. Amen? Amen. I don't have time to get into the keys of the kingdom tonight. That's a whole other story. Praise God. But you're the, you're, it's talking about you are the light of the world. There are people that God has anointed to walk in politics. Oh, that God would reveal to us who they are. And that God would enable us to get some hands on them and show them where they need to be walking. Amen. You are the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hid. That, that these are words we understand. Cannot be healed. It cannot be hid. It cannot be concealed. If you walk in your anointing as the light of the world, you cannot be concealed. How many times have you heard a Christian say, Oh, Lord, I don't want to be visible. I don't want to be seen. I just want to be a little candle under a bushel. I mean, that's what they're saying. Well, he says right here in this passage that you do not light a candle and put it under a bushel. That word bushel is a word that means anything that conceals. God does not want you as the light of the world concealed by anything. He said, in fact, he said, let your light so shine that men may see my good works, saith the Lord. Is that what he said? No, what did he say? Let your light so shine that men may see what? Your good work. And yet there are people today, if you pat them on the back and say, you did a good job, well, give God the glory. They don't even know how to say thank you. I, I tell as gently as I possibly can, brothers and sisters, and that, that when somebody pats you on the back and says, thank you for your service, just, just be intelligent enough to say, thank you for the thanks. Thank you for the support. 
keep the cards and letters rolling in. I mean, do what you can, but acknowledge the fact that you're doing something. I was talking to a, a minister one night and told him, brother, you did a great word, gave a great word tonight. His mother happened to be in the service and, and, and she walked up and I turned to her and I said, ma'am, I want to tell you to your face, thank you for the good job you did in raising this young man. She immediately went into this thing, oh, no, give the glory to God. And right there in front of her son and the pastor of the church, I said, ma'am, excuse me, how many diapers did God change? You ever seen God change a diaper? How many nights did God stay up half a night trying to burp a kid that was having gas problems? How many mornings does God get up at 5 o'clock in the morning when he needed his sleep and stuff a bottle in the kid's mouth because he's crying? How many times did God kneel by the bed and pray for a baby that was battling sickness and disease? I said, God never did any of that, did he? She said, no. I said, but you did a lot of that, didn't you? She said, yeah. And I said, then thank you. Yeah, we give God the glory, but dear lady, you deserve the thanks. You deserve the pat on the back. Because if it had not been for you trusting God, if it had not been for you praying for your kid, if it had not been for you being the example before your child, he wouldn't be doing today what he's doing. So let your light shine before men so that they may see your good works. Let's just make that personal. Say, so that men may see my good works. Now, my next question is, what are you doing? Just a thought. I'm not going to take time for you to answer that tonight. <laughs> we don't have a week and a half for somebody to think one up. No. <laughs> what are you doing? What are you doing that is a good work that you don't mind showing the world? Hallelujah to the Lamb. Is you, oh, don't get me started on, on, on social media today. You staying home, wearing your PJs, sipping your coffee, enjoying your buttered toast, watching church on YouTube or Facebook. When you could have got up and gone to church, how many people in the world are seeing you there all tucked away in your PJs? with your hair all disheveled and your teeth ain't brushed? Huh? How many? Not a soul. So what are you doing with this commandment to let your light so shine? One of the greatest things that a man or a woman can do is to be faithful in attendance to the house of the Lord, to the church house when the doors are open where they need to be sitting. Let me tell you something else. You're a part of the body of Christ. Yeah. Get up tomorrow morning and try dressing without your hands. Get up tomorrow morning and try brushing your teeth without your thumbs. No, don't cut them off. Just try brushing your teeth, getting the toothpaste on the toothbrush, brush your teeth, and after you brush them, floss and gargle, but don't use your thumb in any way. You be there half the morning trying to get toothpaste on your tooth toothbrush. We need the body. And when the opportunity is present for the body to come together, but we don't avail ourselves of that opportunity. It might be that you haven't found where God wants you. God understands that, but at least make an effort to search. Yeah, I'm talking to you. I love you. If I didn't love you, I wouldn't be this blunt with you. You are the light of the world. God made you that way. If you're the light, that means one. He's got something in you that's combustible. It's called the Holy Ghost. Two, there is a means in you by which that light can shine forth. That is your spirit. That is the human wick. Three, he has a fire with which to ignite that wick that is immersed in the oil of the Holy Spirit that will give off a luminescence that is just like it would be if it were he himself lighting the room. Hallelujah.
and every extremity of your body is an element that is ready for fire. Whether it's walking on the water or laying hands on the sick or pointing someone in the right way or taking a hand and lifting somebody up or taking your foot and keeping the devil down, every extremity of your body has the potential to glow with the light of God and let the world see the light that is Jesus Christ on the inside of you. Everything. Hallelujah. Especially your tongue. Oh, God. Oh, that God could find a way to work through his people so that every time you walked into any place of business, anywhere, that before you walked out, you had lit somebody up. Praise God. Are you getting anything out of this? Praise the Lord. Oh, Lord, this is so good. Candlestick, lampstand, that which holds the lighted object. That's your body. God don't want your body broke up. He wants your body to be a solid. Listen, if a, if, if a lamp, now, the, many times the Scripture uses the term candlestick, but we know it means lamp, okay? What do you not, and it's not an electric lamp. It's a lamp that had oil in it and a wick, okay? What has to be in the lamp? Oil. What happens if a lamp's got a crack in it? Oil leaks out. What happens if all the oil leaks out of the lamp? You got a dry wick. You light a dry wick, what's going to happen? It's going to burn it up. It's going to smoke and stink. Okay? First of all, God wants your vessel to be intact. That means healed and whole. God wants your mind, that thinking apparatus, that, that instructs you. Oh, I made the statement earlier before we started the night. It's easier to believe than it is to think. Think about what I just said. It's easier to believe than it is to think. How many of you believe Jesus is a healer? I believe it. But have you ever thought about how that came to be? Praise God. What would be the necessity of the writings of the scriptures that we have if we didn't need to think? Have you thought about that? If we did not need to think, all we would need to see is confess Jesus, believe in your heart, God raised him from the dead, be saved. That's all it took. Just believe him. For if you believe in your heart, confess with your mouth. All you, all you have to do is believe. Well, wouldn't that be a simple thing? But the Bible says, let this mind be in you. The Bible says whatever is pure, honest, just, love the truth, good report, virtuous, think on these things. You know, there are people who think of themselves more highly than they ought to think. But sadly, in the kingdom of God, we've got a lot of people who don't think at all. They fall for anything because they don't think. God expects you to be a thinking person. That's the rule of the soul, the mind, the will, the intellect, and emotions in your work of producing light. Are you with me? The Lord said, come, let us reason together. What does the word reason mean in that sense? It's a verb. It means to think. Yeah, to think. God didn't say, come let us reflect together. He said, let us reason together. Think about it. Do you hear that? Think about it. We need to guard ourselves that we don't allow, and, and 
Again, I'm not afraid of other translations, but we must guard ourselves that we do not allow watered down, weakened versions of words become the translations of our choice to study the scriptures. We need the word of God that's still got some teeth in it, not that which has been snatched toothless and fed with gravy. Am I making sense? I just don't like that. That word is too hard. <laughs> Get over it. Can you imagine what would happen in the Marine Corps or the Army and you're out doing basic training and, and the guy says, give me 50, and you said, well, how about 10? I think 50 is too hard. First of all, what kind of an army would that make if that's the kind they had? Bunch of I'm not even going to repeat what was said because I'm not going to offend my brothers and sisters who have served in other branches of the military because they had to do some push-ups too. I know that. <laughs> but do you understand what I'm saying to you? We don't need to weaken things. Now, we need to keep them strong. Strong. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice. I don't want to do that. That's just too hard. No, the Bible says do it. Just bless God. Do it. And be not conformed to this world, but be you transformed by the renewing of your mind. Oh, that takes so much time. Hey, God told you to redeem the time. What are you going to do with it? Waste it? You talk about the talents that were given out. One guy got five. One guy got two. One guy got one. What did the one do with his one? He wrapped it in a napkin and buried it. And when the Lord came, what did he do to him? He took it away from him. Some of the folks watching tonight and some Christians that we all know are having their time taken away from them because the time God gave them, they hid it. You don't hide what God gives you. You use it. You invest it because you know that he will reap where he did not sow. In the end, it all belongs to him. Y'all get anything out of this, Matt? That dirt. This is about anointing. This is about anointing. You want to walk in your anointing? You have to be salty. God anointed you to be salty. And if you're not salty, you're keeping the Holy Ghost at bay. God anointed you to be light. And if you're not being light, you are keeping the Holy Ghost bay. I don't want to keep Holy Ghost at bay. You know what that means, keeping him at bay? That means keeping him at a distance. I don't want to keep him at a distance. I want him as close as I can get him. I want him all over the inside of me. I want him all over the outside of me. Like the song says, I got something on the inside, working on the outside. Or oh, what a change in my life. <laughs> That's what I want every day of my life, 24-7. I want something on the inside, Holy Ghost. Working on the outside. That's Holy Ghost. I got the Holy Ghost on the inside. He's working on the outside. I want to be salt. I want to be light. I want to be what he made me to be. I want every, I want every affordable benefit of the anointing that I can have in my life. And that means I must be what he told me to be so that anointing can teach me, making me the biggest possible target for Holy Spirit to use any way he chooses. Amen? Say that with me. You folks at home, say that with me, and we'll close with this. S say this, I want to be what God wants me to be. I want to walk in the anointing He has given me to my fullest potential so that I can be greatest at, the, so I can live at the greatest level of anointing so that Holy Ghost will come on me and use me in the greatest potential way. Wow. Think about that. Think about that. And it's depending on the anointing that you have working in your life. Did you get that? Praise God. Thank you, Father, for the Word. Thank you for the people. Thank you that the word has been sown tonight in good ground. And it will produce as needed 
in their life, 30, 60, and 100 fold for your glory in Jesus' name and in his name, everybody that agreed said amen and amen. Praise God. Glory.